so is this folks that want to raise for their own use or to sell or a combination of nation i think okay. a lot of folks aspire to sell yeah yeah there's a there's a lot of information um about poultry <laughs> um about selling and and there's twice as much confusion yeah yeah well that's why i've got some folks from the department of agriculture that are here <clears throat> yeah a little introductory piece to to uh try to <clears throat> to uh get things going so I'll yeah I, 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 uh, real 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 quick sorry i have to drop off for just hopefully five minutes um uh -huh. some, a call that just came in but um yeah. if I, i'll i'll try to come back quick okay uh, very good yeah, we um, we see a lot of people coming here that uh, I don't know, for lack of better words, they they have some sort of adversarial relationship with the Department of Agriculture, and I'm like, they're just people, just yeah. like you and I. You they're know? just trying to help. They're, they're yeah, there well, to help. And uh, I, you I, know, I I have I tell people that I use. The Department of Agriculture and the University of Maine, like the pathology department, people are just so afraid of getting the government involved. And I use them as a tool, you know, I mean, these are their people, but they got a vast knowledge of what's going on. They got their fingers on the, uh, uh, on the pulse of new stuff. But I, I tell my crew, I said, we use these people as our quality control. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, my inspector, um, I mean, I've only, I mean, every time I see them, there's a different one and, oh God, they're so young. I'm like, ooh, <laughs> ooh. but, um, you know, they check on stuff, you know, cause you know, we get complacent. We're not perfect, you yeah. know? And when they say, Hey, check this out, check that. I mean, I don't get offended. I'm like, oh, okay, cool. You know, well, <laughs> we're, but, we're, we've reached the appointed hour. So Scott will, uh, hold you for a little bit and okay. uh, we'll be getting to you in a, a little. A uh, bit of time, and uh, I am gonna share my screen uh, just to remind folks uh, about our agenda for today. Um, and uh, we are recording this, and we are live streaming it to Facebook on the University of Maine Cooperative Extension Livestock uh, Facebook page. Uh, uh, We'll be talking about these topics. And yesterday, um, Kilby Young wasn't able to join us, but he is able to join us today. So we'll uh, be talking a, a little about the value added meat products uh, after um, uh, Scott has a, a chance to talk. Uh, but I do want to thank all our speakers. Uh, and while they are speaking, if you have questions, you can use your chat function that's down at the bottom of your screen. Uh, it will open up another window on your right. And then at the lower part of that right hand screen is where you can type in your question and hit enter. Uh, and if you go even further to the right, there are three little dots. And if you want to, you can save the chat uh, by clicking the three little dots. I am planning to send out the PDF files uh, of our speakers, contact information for speakers, and uh, a link to the recordings uh, to everyone who registered. Now, yesterday I had a little bit of trouble with my uh, presentation. Uh, so we'll see if uh, this one works any better. But I did, the other thing I wanted to mention is uh, be sure if you're moving your laptop uh, to stop your video because uh, a lot of times we can see where you're going. Uh, and to stop your video, that's down at the bottom of your screen. Uh, right next to the mute button is the stop video button. So I'll, I'll I just wanted to remind you about that. So here we go with uh, my little discussion on uh, some poultry meat and egg sale channels.
Oops. I'm Donna Kaufman, and I work with farmers and gardeners in Piscataquis and Penobscot counties. I'll be talking about various livestock and meat sales channels that livestock producers have available to them with a focus on poultry sales and a little about licenses that you need in various venues. Jennifer and Michelle will be providing greater detail. There are several market channels available to poultry producers. Live bird sales on or off the farm, including auctions, have less regulations for the farmer. In Maine, if you're selling baby chicks, you need to sell at least two to a customer. There are folks that sell breeding stock and specialty breeds of poultry, as well as exotic poultry. Auction sales are a low marketing effort, but may bring the lowest price. Direct sales of processed poultry to consumers can increase the regulations, but will also increase the price received. Sales of live birds through auctions takes the least amount of effort. Selling to individuals or selling breeding stock does take more effort and can bring higher prices. Selling processed birds at various venues can provide higher prices but come with more regulations and more costs to get them sold. Farmers markets can provide a high price if located in a more affluent area but the labor costs of staffing the booth during the market can be very high. Also, care must be taken to assure that the meat stays frozen. On farm, it would be wise to have backup for power outages. Harvesting birds can be done on the farm in a very small operation or sent to a processing facility. There is a list of poultry processing facilities on the DACF meat inspection website. Humane Extension does have a fact sheet on on-farm poultry processing that uses a heavy duty plastic shed kit on a cement pad that is estimated to cost about $1,000 and provides a small area that can be easily cleaned. There are a number of options to get your birds processed for sale to customers. Smaller operations only need to register to slaughter their birds with the Maine Department of Agriculture. We still need a license for retail food sales, wholesale sales, and or you may need a mobile vendor's license. If you raise and harvest more than a thousand birds, then you need to move up to the less than 20,000 exempt category. If you harvest and process for other producers, you move to the small enterprise, less than 20,000 exempt category. Jennifer and Michelle will have all the details on these categories. If you are offering cut up birds, an additional license for retail prepackaged meat is necessary. All of these are available on the Maine Department of Agriculture application. Many poultry keepers choose to offer egg sales from their chickens, ducks, geese, or other birds. A humane extension fact sheet that covers what you need to know, sell eggs in Maine, includes cleaning and storage information. The egg carton should have a farm name, address, and zip code. If you are reusing a carton, be sure it is clean and black out any information that doesn't apply to the eggs. You also need to indicate what type of bird your eggs come from, such as duck eggs. Licenses are minimal. A mobile vendor's license may be needed if you take your eggs to a farmer's market or other outdoor market to sell. The labor cost can be, as, can be high at a farmer's market, but some farmers work with other farms to carry their eggs at a farm stand or farmer's market to reduce costs. Here is my contact information. I'll be sending these links and others to folks who have registered for our session today. Thank you. 
Okay, it takes uh, my screen a second to uh, turn on again. There. Okay, Colt. Uh, Colt Dr. Colt Knight, our uh, livestock specialist, will talk about uh, when to tell when animals are ready for market. All right, so hopefully you guys can see my screen. Is this the right screen, Donna? Yep. Okay, great. Uh, so this is a question that, that comes up quite a bit if you're new to raising poultry. Uh, you know, when should we process our poultry? Uh, and yesterday we discussed some red meat categories like beef and pork and lamb and goats and rabbits. Uh, and, and those have a lot of different metrics that we have to go by. Mostly with poultry though, we either go by age or weight. And let's start out with chickens because this is by far and away the most common poultry raised for meat. Uh, and if we raise a basic Cornish cross chicken in a barn with uh, free choice feed, we should be able to get them to five pounds in about 35 to, to 40 days. Uh, these are extremely fast growing birds, but a lot of folks uh, don't like to raise their birds in confinement or they would prefer to raise their birds outside on the grass. So pasture raised birds are extremely popular these days. And you basically have two choices. You can either buy the traditional Cornish cross chicks or you can buy some slow growing chicks uh, like a Freedom Ranger or a Kosher or, or uh, Imperials or Stripes or things like that. Uh, and here at the university, we have done two uh, studies on raising pastured poultry. Uh, so we've got lots of information. If, if you would like more information on pasture utilization, forage intake, growth rates, dressing percentages, uh, how much they eat, how much water they use, feel free to contact us and we can get that information to you. But if you're raising a traditional Cornish cross bird, uh, they're going to stay in the broiler or the brooder for about two weeks and then you're going to move them to your tricking tractor for a week under a, a heat lamp and then they're ready to go out you know and move them on pasture every day uh, and with Cornish cross we can get done in 45 days and yield about a four pound carcass or if you like a heavier carcass you can raise them on up to, to eight weeks of age uh, and, and get up to six or seven pound carcasses on these birds. Now I will warn you with Cornish cross birds, these are fast growing birds. They are not meant to live long lives. Uh, if you raise them for longer than eight weeks, you are rolling the dice on them because uh, sometimes their, their hearts will give out or they'll just die. The death loss increases tremendously on Cornish cross if you raise them past eight weeks of age. Uh, and so some folks would prefer those slow growing birds, the, the Freedom Rangers being the most popular, uh, they will hit that same weight about two weeks later than Cornish crosses. So if you're wanting a four pound carcass, it's going to take them uh, 60 days. Or if you want them a little heavier, you're going to raise those on out to 75 or 80 days. Now the freedom range birds can live long, healthy lives if you choose not to slaughter them, uh, unlike the Cornish. So that's the difference there. But these Cornish are gonna pack on way more meat at a much quicker rate. And then we've got ducks. And, and I'm glad we've got Mr. Greeny on here because he can attest to some of this stuff. Ducks are really important to get those slaughtered before they get too old. And with Pekin ducks, you usually want to kill those about seven weeks of age because if they go any longer than that, you'll start seeing them shed their down feathers all over the yard. And when they have started this process, it is now too late <laughs> to get them plucked properly. Uh, so if you process the Pekin ducks before they're seven weeks old, you can do a pretty good job plucking their feathers. If you wait past seven weeks old, uh, it's really, really difficult to pluck their feathers. So Pekin ducks, they're ready in about seven weeks. They're about seven to eight pounds. Uh, as far as efficiency goes, 
uh, they kind of outproduce chickens, which is pretty amazing. Uh, and then if you want the great big Pekins, the jumbo Pekins, they take 12 weeks to get to full size, but they're going to be 10, 12 pound birds. So much larger. And then the other common duck that's kept for meat production is the Muscovy duck. Uh, and Muscovy ducks mature much slower and pack on weight much leaner uh, than your Pekin ducks. And so those Muscovies are going to be anywhere from 10 to 18 pounds. Most folks will keep the female Muscovies for egg layers uh, and slaughter the Drake Muscovies. Uh, and, and even then, they're only going to be four and a half to five and a half pounds live weight at that time. Turkeys are all over the map. It depends on what breed of turkey you want to raise. A modern commercial turkey will reach uh, slaughter weight in as early as 16 weeks. So hens, we would raise those till they're four months of age and they're gonna be anywhere from eight to 16 pounds. The toms are much bigger animals. And so we generally raise those out to be much bigger birds. Uh, and they're gonna be about 19 weeks old when they get to their full size uh, and weigh anywhere from 16 to 24 pounds. So when you go to the grocery store this Thanksgiving, uh, and you see the smaller birds and then the bigger birds in the freezer, you can almost sex them just by the weight because that's just how the commercial industry works on those. Uh, but then heritage breed turkeys, uh, depending on which heritage breed you choose, uh, again, they're gonna be all over the map. But in general, these take 26 to 28 weeks to hit their full size. And depending on if they're a hen or a tom could be anywhere from 10 to 28 pounds. And then just for giggles, I threw in some other poultry uh, that, that a lot of folks might not think that you can eat or, or you don't eat very regularly. Uh, geese, uh, there are lots of breeds of geese. Most geese have been bred for meat production. Some breeds were bred for down production and some breeds were bred for egg production, but most geese were bred for meat production. Uh, and they're gonna take anywhere from four to eight months to reach their 10 to 15 pound size. African geese, on the other hand, which were heavily bred for meat production, should reach 18 pounds in 18 weeks. Uh, quail, depending on which variety of quail you are raising, uh, they're ready to eat anywhere from 33 to 112 days. And guinea fowl, most folks do not raise guinea fowl for meat production. Uh, most folks keep guinea fowl as pets, uh, to eat ticks, uh, as, uh, as guard animals, that kind of thing. Uh, but you can eat guinea fowl once they're, they're 16 weeks old, but there's not a lot of meat on guinea fowl. They're, they're only about three pounds when they heat, when they hit their, their slaughter size. So, uh, it's not real economical to raise guinea meat, uh, but you can eat those things. And I've heard they taste pretty good, but I've never actually ate one. And that's all I have. Uh, so if you have any questions, feel free to contact me or you can ask questions in the chat box. I, I don't see any questions, Donna, so. And you're still muted, Donna. Okay. Well, let me share. I shared my uh, screen, and I hopefully have Jennifer's uh, slide set up there. Yes. Okay. So we'll turn it over to you, Jennifer. Hi, I'm Dr. Everly. Uh, you can advance forward. Um, so today I'm going to introduce myself. We're going to go over some of the rules for poultry sales. Um, I'm going to talk about some of the resources we have for you, and then, of course, take some questions. All right, so I'm Dr. Jennifer Everly. Um, I'm the director of the Maine Meat and Poultry Inspection Program. Um, we uh, are in charge of regulating meat and poultry, basically, in the state of Maine. Um, and we oversee the inspection programs as well as uh, some of the poultry exemptions, which I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. All right, so 
the big question that you should ask yourself uh, when you're deciding, you know, what you're going to do uh, with your chickens is how many chickens do I want to raise and what do I want to do with them? Okay, and that's going to kind of form uh, which direction you're going to go uh, as far as licensing and inspection, etc. Keep going. So there's uh, more options for poultry. If any of you were on the red meat uh, talk yesterday, there's not as many options for red meat. There are some extra options for poultry um, because poultry falls under Poultry Products Inspection Act and uh, red meat falls under the Federal Meat Inspection Act. So uh, the options are to do poultry under inspection, to process poultry under the retail exemption. You can do custom poultry uh, processing. And then we have those three poultry exemptions that Donna referred to briefly in her uh, introduction. All right, so um, the first one I'm gonna talk about is poultry inspection. This is poultry that's, that's slaughtered and processed under inspection. This can be USDA or the state's program, my program, MMPI, um, can be sold in any quantity and made into any product and can be distributed almost anywhere. So this is gonna give you the most freedom of all the options. Keep going. Um, the limitation is that there's only two inspected poultry slaughter facilities in Maine right now. Uh, there's Commonwealth Poultry, which is inspected by USDA, and there's Tide Mill Organics, which is inspected by the state. There is, I do believe there's some poultry processing, uh, but these are the only to do slaughter in Maine. Go ahead. Um, so both USDA and MMPI provide continuous inspection. That means the USDA or the MMPI inspector is assigned to watch over slaughter or poultry processing uh, anytime the poultry products are being produced. And uh, both USDA and MMPI inspected poultry products are equally safe. Keep going. So what is the difference between USDA and state inspected poultry? Uh, the short answer is just where it can be distributed. Go forward. So uh, Commonwealth poultry products can be distributed within Maine to other states and be exported. Tide mail can be distributed within the state of Maine and to other states, but cannot be exported. And honestly, the only reason they can't be exported is because I'd have to uh, negotiate another cooperative agreement and Tide Mill didn't ask me to, so I didn't bother. But if they tell me they want to export, I'll, I'll get the new agreement so they can export. But nobody has asked for it, so I didn't bother doing it. I keep going. All right, so you can see uh, on the left, I have, uh, that, that's a Tide Mill label. And then down below, I don't know whose label it is. I found it on the internet, it doesn't really matter. But you can see that the mark of inspection for our MMPI um, and, US, and the USDA mark of inspection are very, very similar. Keep going. Um, so inspected poultry from Commonwealth, uh, Commonwealth poultry or from Tide Mill Organics can be sold. You can sell it directly from your farm store or stand. You can sell it at farmer's markets. You can wholesale it to hotels, restaurants, schools. You can wholesale it to grocery stores, both local and regional and national. Um, and then you can do internet sales. So they're gonna, it's gonna give you the most freedom. If you're raising poultry, if you have it inspected, you're gonna be able to do the most with it. Um, but you may not need this much. You know, if you're only selling to your local markets, if you're only selling at farmer's markets, you may not need this, but it, it's there. I right, keep going. Um, so inspected, and then this is something that's attractive uh, for some people. Uh, Inspected poultry from Commonwealth Poultry or from Tide Mill Organic can be labeled with your farm name and your address and you can make special claims. So this is a label, um, Weston's Meat Cutting used to be a uh, state inspected for poultry and they moved to a, one of the 20,000 bird exemptions, but this is one of their old labels. And as you can see, um, you know, it's got prominent the name of the farm, their address. They made claims here that it was pasture raised and organic. And, you know, Weston's was only a tiny part of that label. So if it's important to you that it be marketed as your birds, um, this is something to consider when you're doing inspected versus um, one of the other, other options. Keep going. 
Um, the costs associated with doing inspection would be the kill fees and processing costs charged by the slaughterhouse. You've got to get label approvals, which sometimes can take, depending on how complicated it is, it can take a few days, it can take a couple weeks. It just depends on how, how many special claims you're making. Um, you got to pay to print the labels. Um, you're going to have to get licenses, which uh, Michelle will talk about in a little bit. And then, um, you know, there's only two facilities in Maine, and they're both fairly booked. So, you know, I'm not going to say they're completely booked. I don't want to take away business. But if your birds are ready at a certain time and you can't get a slaughter date, then that's a problem for you. Um, so that's something to, to keep in mind. Keep going. All right, so let's talk about uh, the retail and the custom exemptions. So these are both exemptions from the Poultry Products Inspection Act. So if you're operating under these exemptions, you do not, inspector does not have to be continually present, uh, but they will visit routinely, uh, usually at least, at least annually, hopefully. This year is a little weird because of COVID, but in general, it's, it's usually annual visits. That's your naughty, then we come more often. Um, so the retail exemption, this allows for processing of poultry that was slaughtered under inspection. So under USDA or MMPI inspection or under one of the poultry exemptions, which I'm gonna talk about later. And actually Scott can talk about that because he operates under some of those exemptions. There is one narrow specific exemption to not being able to, to, being able to slaughter under retail and I'll discuss that in a second. Keep going. Um, so under the retail exemption, there doesn't need to be an inspector there every day, but you do need to be licensed. Um, and you don't have to have a HACCP plan, it's, which is a, it's a comprehensive food safety plan that inspected facilities must follow every day, um, unless you're doing vacuum packing or you're making ready to eat foods. So it is a little easier. Uh, a HACCP plan is, it's, it's a lot to keep up. It's a lot of um, paperwork and there's a lot of work. So this is a consideration, keep going. Um, so the, ex the limitations on retail exemption is you can only sell 75 pounds in a single transaction to a household customer, because if you sell, so, so if you sell 200 pounds to one guy, you're, you're wholesaling, you're not, you know, they're not going to eat 200 pounds of chicken, probably <laughs> in the next, in the next month. So this is the limitation. It has to be 75 in a single transaction. And then if you're a whole, you can do this, if it's fresh chicken, you can sell, and I'm gonna talk about this a little more in a second, um, a certain percentage can be sold to hotels, restaurants, or institutions, and you can only sell 150 pounds in a single transaction. Keep going. So this is the limitation here. If you wanted to sell to hotels, restaurants, or institutions, institutions would be like um, nursing homes or schools, uh, places like that. You can sell up to 25% or $56,600 in sales, whichever is less, uh, to those institutions in one calendar year. The other 75% has to be sold directly to the end consumer. So, you know, from your, from your store, from your farmer's market, it has to be sold to the end customer. Keep going. Um, so no slaughter of, of poultry is allowed under this exemption. Um, you can only process further, further process inspected poultry or poultry that was slaughtered under one of the poultry exemptions, which I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. There is one tiny exemption, which is a retail store that sells a live animal at the store to a customer can be slaughtered and then processed per the customer specifications. So if you scroll to the next slide, this is um, the live market exemption. So this is, I don't think we have any of these in Maine, but this would be, um, you know, the unfortunately this is like the live market in Wuhan that the coronavirus started at. Um, this is where you have the, the, the chickens and you go and you pick out that chicken and they, they, they slaughter it for you right there in front of you. Um, this is not, a, not something we see much in Maine. So keep going, if at all. I don't know if there's one in Portland or not, but I don't think so. Um, so some of the costs associated with retail exemption, you've got to have a kitchen um, for the for processing the meat. You got to and you'll, those licenses associated with that. Um, 
you have to purchase that inspected or exempt poultry, exempt poultry from somebody, either a distributor or somebody like Scott. And then you have to uh, print your labels. You, know, you gotta pay for, for printing. You don't have to have approvals though. All right, so the custom exemption, we don't see as much of this. Uh, we see, there's some people who do this. It's not as popular as the red meat uh, custom exemption, but this is poultry slaughtered and processed by a custom operator for the personal use of the animal's owner, family, and non-paying guests are exempt from inspection. Keep going. So uh, someone pointed out to me that it, there's a picture of red meat here and it should be poultry, but I couldn't find any good pictures on the internet of, of custom poultry. But you'll see on the label, um, it says not for sale. Okay, this animals, chickens, geese, ducks, whatever poultry you're doing, it cannot be sold um, under the custom exemption. All right, so you're like, well, why is this in this presentation, Dr. Everly? Because this is about selling meat in Maine. There is some stuff you can do. So we'll scroll down. So you can sell, I mean, chickens, I don't know how, many, how much share you're gonna sell on a chicken, it's not that big, but maybe a big turkey, you could sell to two people, but you can sell shares or whole live animals while the animals are still alive. Now that may be you drive up to the custom, you know, slaughterhouse and he's got some chickens out back and he's and he sells them to sells them to you. Um, but they need you need to own them. They need you need to be the owner of the bird before it goes to the custom operator. And then the custom operator who slaughters and processes the animal has to keep a record of every owner of the animal. This isn't such a big thing in poultry because people don't tend to sell shares, but sometimes it comes up with red meat because they want to sell, you know, one twentieth of a cow. And it's like, that's, that's fine, except you've got to have records for all 20 owners. And the custom operator may be like, no, I'm not going to keep 20 records for 20 different animal owners. Keep going. So the farmer can sell the live chicken or shares in a large turkey. He can charge for the delivery of the poultry to the slaughterhouse. He can charge for picking up and delivering the poultry products, but you cannot charge for poultry products. So that means if you've got a flock of, of 30 birds and you manage to sell 25 of them, um, but when you're, and then your slaughter date comes up and all 30 of them get slaughtered, yeah, you can deliver those 25 you sold, but those other five have got to go in your freezer. You cannot sell them once the animal is dead. Keep going. Um, so custom exemption costs, uh, if you want to pursue this to sell your birds, is you're going to have to do some aggressive marketing to make sure that all, actually this year, you don't have to be very aggressive at all. Everybody's going to buy anything, but um, you do need to make sure that you have sold all of them before your slaughter date. And then of course, you're going to have to pay the custom poultry, uh, custom exempt poultry operator to slaughter the birds for you. Keep going. Um, so now I'm going to the, the category I had to add uh, from yesterday's presentation. These are the poultry exemptions. There are no similar exemptions for red meat, much to the red meat people's dismay, but it, you know, the law is a law. Um, and this allows sales of uninspected poultry that um, you've, you've had slaughtered without inspection, but it puts limits on how many birds can be processed and what can you do, do with them in exchange. Scroll down. Um, basically, you're here you're picking with, so the trade-off is you're not having it inspected all the time, but there's going to be limitations just so if, you know, there is some kind of outbreak, um, if the distribution is limited and, and the possibility for sickness is, is limited since they weren't inspected. So there's three poultry exemptions available. These, the under a thousand exempt uh, there's the other under 20,000 exempt grower producer and the other under 20,000 exempt small enterprise. Keep going. Okay, so this is what, if you want to do under 1,000 bird exempt, um, you must raise all of the birds yourself. You can't buy them from other people. We don't get too worked up if you buy some chicks that are a couple of days old. I, I mean, that you raise them. You just bought the chicks someplace else, but um, you do have to raise them yourself. You have to sell less than a thousand in a calendar year. 
And you have to keep good records of where all the birds are sold and to whom you're selling them to so they can be tracked down because there really is not a whole lot of oversight by us. Um, for, so it, it's important that we can track down where the birds went. Keep going if there's a problem. All right, uh, some other restrictions. You had the birds have to be sold whole. You cannot cut them up. You cannot make pot pies. They have to be whole birds. Um, you have to register with the department as a under thousand bird exempt operator. It's a free registration. Um, and you must meet the statutes that are in uh, Title 22 main revised statutes. And I, I gave it there for your reference regarding labeling, uh, price of sale, et cetera. So not a lot of, um, not a lot of oversight, but you're not selling a lot of birds either. All right, keep going. Um, the registered establishments are visited yearly by the inspectors. That didn't happen this year because of COVID, um, but usually it's, it's about yearly. And then the costs associated with this exemption, um, obviously you got to raise your birds, you got to get labels printed, and you have to have the equipment to process the birds. Keep going. All right, so let's talk about the under 20,000 bird exempt grower producer. So for this exemption, you must also raise all the birds yourselves, exempting, you know, buying chicks from someplace. You have to be licensed with the department. It's not a registration, it is a license. Um, and because you're licensed, you have to meet these statutes and you also have to meet these regulations in uh, chapter 343. Um, keep going. I don't think that Michelle can tell you the licenses aren't super expensive, but you do have to have them. Um, the good thing about why bother <laughs> is you can sell whole birds, you can sell parts, you can sell pot pies, you can do what you like with the birds. Um, and you know, I, I'm not an expert in marketing, but these may be more marketable than birds processed under the thousand bird exemption. You know, the label for the thousand bird exempt has to say on it, not inspected. You know, it, it's very clear that this was not inspected by someone. And the labels on these are a little kinder, a little gentler. They don't look quite as quite as um, scary to the consumer. So, uh, and Scott can talk to you about this and whether he's, he's seen this or not, but um, you could do more with the birds and they may be a little more marketable. People, you know, people might be more willing, a restaurant, for example, might be more willing to accept it because they know it came from a licensed facility. Um, I don't know for sure, but uh, okay. So we can go on. And then uh, for this one, you can raise and process up to 20,000 birds in a calendar year. Uh, costs are gonna be raising the birds, your label, equipment, your licenses. And just so you know, even if you're only doing, let's say you're only doing 500 birds in a year. Well, if you already have a, a commercial kitchen license, cause maybe you have a dairy operation too, there's no reason you can't do the under 20,000 bird exempt, even if you're only making 500. Uh, doing 500 birds. It's, you really should talk to the department about it because if you want the freedom to, to say do pot pies and you already have a commercial kitchen license, there's no reason to do under a thousand when you could do 20,000. Keep going. All right, and then the third poultry exemption is uh, small enterprise. They must also be licensed by the department. Um, they are limited to whole birds and cut-ups. So no pot pies, no further processing, no sausage, uh, just whole birds and parts. And they can only process 20,000 birds as well in a calendar year. So what is the advantage of this one over a grower producer? Keep going. Um, for this one, you can purchase birds to slaughter in addition to raising your own birds. Just like uh, the grower producer, these may be more marketable than the thousand bird ones because again, the label is a little less scary. Um, and then the quality, there's something you have to keep in mind, the quality of the birds may be uneven depending on who you purchase them from. Um, because if you scroll down, these are labeled with your, uh, I'll, I'll get to the label in a second, but these do have your label on them. So it is your name on them. So you have to be sure you're happy with what the, the birds that you purchased uh, under this 20,000 exempt small enterprise. Um, you have to follow the regulations uh, same as grower producer in chapter 343 and in the statutes, um, and same costs as the um, other 20,000 exempt uh, 
exemption. Keep going. So this is where I'm going over what's technically legal. <laughs> so it is technically legal for a small enterprise producer to buy birds from a local poultry producer. So in the case of Scott and I, um, I could bring him some chickens and he could buy those birds from me. You know, he could buy them for a penny. He could, you know, buy them, <laughs> whatever you want to say. He buys them from me, processes them, and then he can sell them back to me, you know, for whatever he wants. Maybe he sells them back to me for the cost of processing them. Um, and then I can then go take those birds and sell them if I want to at a farmer's market, as long as I get my licenses that I need to, you know, to sell at a farmer's market. Um, but the important thing is that the principal label on the package has to be the small exempt, uh, small enterprise exempt label. You cannot cover up, I could not cover up Scott's label with my own farm label. All right, so if you scroll down, I've got an example to show you. So this was, um, I don't have any of Scott's labels, but this was Tide Mills label back when they were a small enterprise operation. And if I, um, if I took my, my birds to them, it would have to have the Tide Mill label on it. And I could put a little label, a little sticker maybe next to it that was like raised on Jen's farm, but you cannot cover up that label. And so that's why I kind of made a point of talking about how under, under inspection, you can have your own farm label. That's, that's kind of the big principal difference there uh, between small enterprise and inspection is um, it's, I guess, how you want to market it to some extent. So keep going. Um, and then birds sold under the, the poultry exemptions can be sold from the farm at farmer's markets, delivered to the customer's home by the operator, by the person who, who, who slaughtered them, keep going. Uh, they can be received into a community uh, a CSA, a locally owned grocery store, locally owned restaurant. Now we've defined local as within that municipality. So, you know, if you live in Belfast and you're selling it at a, at a store in Presque Isle, I'm going to question whether that's local or not. Um, but it should be in your local area. Keep going. All right, so very important. Uh, you can only do one exemption per calendar year. Keep going. So you may think, oh, I'll do this one and this one and this one. There is a... There is a way to work around this, which I'll let Scott talk about. Um, but the same facility and equipment can be used for two exemptions in the same calendar year, provided that both operations are completely separate besides the equipment in the building. And then one exemption, you do one exemption and then you cut it off and then you do the other exemption. You can't do small enterprise today and custom tomorrow and small enterprise the day after that. You have to pick one do it, finish it, and then move on to the next. Keep going. Um, there has to be financial and temporal autonomy between the two operations. And I'm gonna let Scott talk about this. And if in doubt, you need, just call the department. We're not try out to get you. Um, we'd rather you called us and said, this is what I wanna do. And we'll tell you, okay, well, you know, that's legal. That's not, Ill that's not legal, <laughs> um, but we'll hopefully, if you tell us what you want to do with the birds, we can hopefully find, um, figure out what's best, what's going to work for you um, and be legal, of course. Keep going. So here's some resources. Um, this is our website. This has maps and contact information for the custom, um, sorry, for the inspected facilities in Maine. And then it's got maps and contact information for the custom exempt facilities. Keep going. Um, we also have guidance documents on all three exemptions if you're not sure which exemption is right for you. Um, and then, of course, there's some registration forms for the under a thousand birds and then blank, excuse me, license forms, which you would use for the 20,000 bird exemptions and retail. <coughs> excuse me. Uh, and then this is a pretty interesting document. It's USDA's document. Um, but this is a guidance document that explains all the different exemptions, um, retail, custom, under, under 1,000, under 20,000. Um, and we use this as basis for what we do um, because the poultry regulations are sometimes a little um, 
difficult, I guess, to figure out what the what the intent of the of the feds was when they wrote them. I right, keep going. Um, this is our uh, DACF webpage for licensing. Um, this is gets you some information on the licenses you'll need if you're doing retail or twenty thousand birds. Keep going. Um, and then this is the main line. Uh, both myself and Michelle, who's going to speak next, can be reached via this number. Uh, we're working at home because of the pandemic, but um, it will get to us somehow. They will route it over to us. Um, and if we, if 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 you have further questions, let, let us help us help you. We will. I really don't mind helping. Keep going. And then uh, I thank you. And I forgot, I guess I didn't put my email on this um, presentation, but I'll put it in the chat. So if anybody has any questions they want to email me, um, they have that option as well. Okay, I'm done. Okay, any questions for Jennifer? Dr. Everly. Uh... I'm going to ask you this because I get asked this constantly. Say I raise pasture broilers and I don't slaughter them myself. Where can you legally take them to be slaughtered and packaged for resale These without, are without selling the, the animal as live like you would a custom exempt option? So um, if you're hmm. You would either, you could take it to either of the inspected facilities. So you could take it to Commonwealth Poultry. You could take it to Tide Mill. Um, and if it's it's pasture raised, I assume you want pasture raised on your label. Um, if you also want, you know, Colts pasture raised birds, you want you you to be the principal label. It has to go to Commonwealth Poultry or Tide Mill, or if you can find a poultry place out of state. I don't think anybody wants to do that, but you could. And then you could still do, however, you could take it to a small exempt facility. So the small exempt facility will have to put their label on it. So if, it, like, if you took it to Greenies, he would put his label on it. You could put a little sticker to the side though that said uh, raised on pasture at, at Colt's farm. Um, and the, what you would need to do is make sure you've kept documentation to show that you can prove that claim because what will happen is if it's found in commerce and somebody's like ah, I heard that cold is a you know ah, something something I don't think that was great they, they were pasture raised you have to be able to prove that your label claim is correct um, but in that case it's on you to have it have that documentation and you can't have it on the principal label it has to be um, you know a little sticker off to the side um, Scott if let's say Scott was doing them for you, um, he should not be putting pasture raised on there because he's not collecting information from you to prove it was pasture raised. That makes sense? Yes. But I, I, I think a lot of folks have a misconception that because there are thousands or 20,000 bird exemptions that there's no licensing or, or expectations that go along with that. And I think it's like a free for all to be able to sell local. And it's really tough sometimes for me as a, as a non-government person to, to explain the differences between the exemptions and what all is important. So I'm really glad you gave this talk and I hope it will clear things up for some folks. Well, people should remember too that these are exemptions from the Poultry Products Inspection Act. They're not exemptions from Maine licensing. You still got to get licenses. <laughs> um, you still have to register if you're not if you're under a thousand birds. You you still have to do some things. <laughs> but um, I'm glad I'm glad you're telling people they're not exempt from everything because they're not. They're just exempt from being inspected continually, like birds are at um, Tide Mill or Commonwealth. Yeah, you still have to get the exemption. It's it's not just a right free for all. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, our next person is um, Michelle Newbigin. She's also with the Department of Agriculture, Conservation and Forestry. She's the Inspection Process Analyst Coordinator. She'll be talking about the main license to sell poultry meat. And I have her presentation on my screen. Let me bring it up.
there. Does everybody see it okay? Can everybody see her presentation? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? <laughs> so I can, can hear you, Michelle. Okay, I've been trying to unmute myself here for a few minutes. <laughs> um, okay, um, so I'm here to talk with you about all things licensing as it pertains to meat and poultry sales. I apologize if you were here yesterday because it's the same presentation, so you might want to get a coffee or something if you heard me yesterday. I did get a completed application though from an attendant yesterday, so that was great. Um, okay, um, first slide. So do I need a license? Um, you may not engage in interstate commerce in the business of buying, selling, preparing, processing, packing, storing, transporting, or otherwise handling meat, meat food products, or poultry products unless you hold a valid license. Um, this holds true for all other food products as well, not just meat products. So if you want to do value added stuff with some of your um, farm raised produce and things like that, you would need a license. Um, the only exception to this rule is um, if you want to sell fresh produce, no license is required for that. Um, so what licenses are required to sell red meat and poultry? The type of license required depends on your activity. You may only need one of these licenses or a combination of them depending on your business plan. So if you want to run um, a red meat poultry inspected slaughter facility, you'd need a commercial slaughterhouse license. Um, these licenses, I'm, $50 is the, is the most expensive. Um, if you need more than one, obviously it'll run you more money, but um, it's really not, really not all that bad. Um, and if you want to further process the livestock uh, meat or meat food products, you'd need a commercial meat and poultry processing license. Um, so to do the retail exemption, you would need a um, retail food establishment license and a further processing of red meat or poultry license. Um, and you would also need the uh, variants that Dr. Everly um, referred to if you're going to vacuum package or make ready to eat food products such as beef jerky um, you'd need the approved variants before you could sell these products you could um, further process you know cut and stuff without that but you'd need the variants before you could do your packaging um, and you can also use a commercial kitchen at another location to do the processing and bring it back to your retail establishment um, and sell it just pre-packaged there if you don't have a proper kitchen. Um, some people um, do do that. Um, and then if you want to wholesale or distribute pre-packaged inspected red meat and or poultry to restaurants, hotels, institutions, and other stores for resale or business use, you would need to have a wholesale distributor of meat and poultry products license. Um, that's a $50 license as well. Um, and what's kind of nice is that we can amend a license at any time to add or remove activities. So if you decide you want to do something else and it requires another license, we can just add it on. Or if you've decided, you know, you're not going to be a wholesale distributor anymore, we can take it off and um, save you 50 bucks when we renew. Um, so, and then for the poultry exemptions that Dr. Everly um, spoke of, you need a commercial food processing license uh, for both the grower producer fewer than 20,000 bird exemption and the small enterprise exemption. Um, and that's a $50 license. The other um, little bit of an expense is if you're on a um, private water or septic source, um, you need to do a water test, which we'll get into in a minute. Um, and then as has been mentioned, there is no license required for the fewer than 1,000 bird exemption. However, you do need to fill out the registration form and get it into us. Um, actually, kind of works out for you because if um, th then you're um, all registered and we know who you are and we can provide any assistance um, as well. I think you're behind a slide on me here, Donna. Here we go. Um, so we can, you know, provide assistance and and, and help you out with uh, different things as well. Um, and then a mobile vendor license um, is necessary if you want to take your uh, prepackaged products, meat and poultry to farmers markets, cross fairs, etc. Um, now this mobile vendor license only covers 
prepackaged foods. Um, doesn't cover any processing on site, any cooking on site or anything like that. Um, so if you take a five pound package, you can't tear, you know, you can't break it down into uh, packages for somebody else. You ha you'd have to sell it the way it was. Um, and then you'd need the prepackaged meat license to go with the mobile vendor license to, um, to sell. Um, and then you only need one mobile vendor's license. You can take it you can take your products anywhere in the state with the one mobile vendor's license. You don't need one for each market or craft fair or anything like that. Um, you may also need a food, store, uh, food storage warehouse license if you're gonna store red meat or poultry at a location other than your processing location. Uh, for some reason you don't have enough room and you need to use a freezer somewhere else, um, you'd need to license for that. Um, and then we've got a few uncommon licenses um, that are there, um, like the broker. Uh, if you're engaged, if you want to get in the business of buying or selling livestock products or poultry products for other persons on commission, or otherwise negotiate purchases or sales of these products, um, you'd need a broker license. And I'm not sure if we even have any licensed in the state of Maine. Um, if we do, there can't be more than one or two. Um, and then the other uncommon license is the, the public warehouse where the entity acts as a um, temporary custodian of meat, meat food products or poultry products um, stored in that entity's warehouse for a fee. Um, and we do have one in South Portland, um, actually a miracle that um, currently does this. Um, now to obtain a license application, you can call our main office um, and request one. Um, my staff would be happy to mail or email you an application. Um, that could work out for you too, because they could also help help you fill it out over the phone. Um, or you can download an application uh, from our website at the link below um, and um, fill it out yourself. Um, beware though, it usually prints out on eight and a half by 14 legal size paper. So if you don't have that paper handy, it's gonna print kind of funky. Um, and then for water testing requirements, um, private water sources, we require water tests for coliform and nitrates. Um, and the water test must be performed by a state accredited lab. Um, if, if you're a new applicant, the water test must be done within 30 days of the application date. Um, and if you're just renewing your license, it's gotta be within a year. So if you get your renewal in on time, it's possible that the water test can be used um, the same water test you did the year before. Um, so that's, that can work out for you. Um, and I've um, got a list of the state accredited labs um, that you can call to get your uh, water test kit. Um, and you don't need a water test or septic approval for municipal water and septic sources. And if you're selling, you know, prepackaged meat only, obviously you wouldn't need a water test either. Um, and for a septic approval, we're looking for um, either the HHE 200, which is the subsurface wastewater disposal rules um, application from when your septic was actually installed. That would be our preferred, um, preferred method. Or you can get a letter from your town code enforcement officer or from a licensed plumbing inspector um, and have them come by and do a visual um, of your septic to um, send us a letter on their letterhead stating that their septic is in working order, is suitable for your purposes, and is in compliance with Maine's subsurface disposal rules. Um, and then we only need the septic documentation once. You don't need to submit that every year with your renewal. Uh, we keep it on file. Um, you'd only need to resubmit if your um, business activity changes or if your septic fails and you, um, God forbid, and, and you need to get a new septic system. Um, and then to apply, you would um, complete the license application and include um, all your required documents uh, along with the appropriate fees, mail it to us or fax it to us um, and try and send it in to us um, at least 30 days before you wish to begin operating. Um, we're allowed 30 days by law to get you an inspection once we receive a completed application. So that's why I say the 30, uh, you'd wanna get it in like 30 days in advance. We try to, um, assist you if you're in a little early, but um, if, if you're in a bit of a pinch, but um, there's no guarantees. So um, yeah, and I put my, um, then there's 
our contact information. I did put my email address in the chat uh, before I spoke, started speaking. In case um, someone wants to email me any questions, I'm happy to help. Anybody's got any questions, I can answer them now. Any questions for Michelle? All right, I'm off the hook. <laughs> oh, just wait a second. Well, I'll 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 sit through the the show here in case somebody comes up with one. Okay, very good. Now I've lost Scott. Where did, there he is. Okay, Scott, do you have any slides or anything that you needed to show? Yeah, I have it on muted. Um, no, I'm not that prepared. Okay. Are you kidding me? Those fancy slides. I was gonna. I was gonna make you a co-host if you had one. Oh, I'm sorry. No, I. I uh, wasn't that prepared. Um, next time. Next time. It's one of those PowerPoint things. I'll have to talk to my 17 year old. Ask how to do those things. Yeah. But uh, I. I. I love hearing all this talk about poultry and and uh, raising chickens and turkeys and such. Um, I think a lot of people think I have feathers in my blood because uh, I, we've been doing it so long. And, you know, going, going back to um, the first presenter, I can't remember his name. Cole. Um, Cole, yep. Um, you know, he was talking about poultry, um, uh, the different types of poultry, and he brought up some very valuable information there. Um, and I just wanted to go back and touch on that a little bit because one of the things that we do here from our farm is um, we, we do a lot of education with our customers. We feel it's kind of uh, a responsibility when we're dealing with these folks because people only know what they know. And sometimes they read stuff on the in internet and they think it's fact. And uh, so we have to dispel a lot of things with some of the customers. but. Um, you know, one of the um, uh, things with broils we run into all the time is um, the health of the poultry. When, when people are buying these birds, these broiler chickens, um, they feed them a uh, free choice their whole life. And out about four and a half, five weeks, we, we caution our customers that buy broiler chicks from us of what we call gorging syndrome where there's a, there's a growth spurt in their broiler chickens and these birds consume an enormous amount of feed and they, um, I guess what I'm, my understanding is, is the liver will sweat off some of the protein into the abdominal cavity, putting pressure on the diaphragm. And a lot of people think these birds just die from heart attacks, but actually they, they, will, they will tip over on them um, and die. Uh, usually they're found on their breasts with their legs outstretched and the neck outstretched. And if, if you um, were to cut the abdominal cavity, the soft part, there's a yellow, uh, not yellow, it looks like um, uh, apple juice will come squirting out. Well, what this does is build up a pressure in the abdominal cavity where the bird can't breathe and the bird will die. And this is enhanced by hot weather. I tell my customers, I've said it a thousand times, broiler chickens are like peas, they wilt in the heat. And some people put in broiler chickens, you know, in the middle of the summer and they have a higher than normal or acceptable uh, death lo uh, loss. Um, so that, that's with broiler chicken. We warn people, I'll send out warnings um, to our customers via Facebook that we're hitting the four and a half, five week stage, you know, be careful of this, be careful of that. As I said, people only know what they know. So we just kind of remind them to go to time feeding. And uh, we take them off the, the hanging feeders and we move them to trough feeders. So there's enough room for everybody to get in there and eat the feed. And um, the, a telltale sign is when people show up with their broiler chickens and there's one little teeny tiny chicken, that usually means that there's not enough space for the, all the chickens to eat. They should all grow in uniform. Um, the other... Um, um, the, the other thing is the heat intolerance. A lot of people will take their broiler chickens and they'll put a fan on them. Don't do that. They, they, they don't like 
wind blowing them. You can have the fans blowing over their heads, but don't don't put a fan on them. They, remember, they're just babies. And we have to remind our customers that these birds are only a few weeks old. You know, they're still babies. Um, and um, one of the other things that I caution people about um, is uh, we have a lot of people that do the uh, chicken tractors and with all the best intentions to start out, but as the birds get bigger, they're harder and harder to move. And, you know, human nature kicks in where people go, oh, I'll move it tomorrow, I'll move it the next day. These birds are sitting in their own feces and it's grinding into the breast. We run into a lot of problems with breast blisters or manure that's just ground right into the breast. And when we process them, sometimes we have to cut away the skin because the manure is just stained it. And that's, that's contamination and, and we don't like that. That's a dirty word here. Um, on turkeys, this is a big issue with people. People will buy turkeys from um, different hatcheries, uh, feed stores. Um, there's only, I think there's about six or seven really commercial or big hatcheries that supply eggs. And they supply eggs to all the same hatcheries. And some hatcheries have their own purebred stock, but the bronze and the uh, large strain or the, the uh, broad-breasted whites, um, and they basically come from about three of the breeders um, around the country and they ship eggs to all the hatcheries. But the, the point I wanna make is within the um, bronze birds and the, uh, the broad-breasted whites, there's about four different strains of turkeys. So these, these are like the, the, the midgets, the smalls, the mediums, and the largest, and they definitely grow at different rates. So if you put in a large strain turkey in April, that thing's gonna be 50 pounds by Thanksgiving time. We used to grow the large strain. We would bring them in in August, mid-August. We'd bring in a couple thousand, and those birds would dress easily 18 to 24 pounds. Um, um, at by Thanksgiving time. So they grow very fast. And the, the I, don't, I don't know what you wanna call it, but what happens in the industry is everybody wants you to buy their birds and say they're the best birds you've ever had. And they grew so big and it's great and it's great and it's great. But the end product when it's on the table or getting ready to go in the oven, is it exactly the size that you want? Because people get sick of eating turkey and they end up throwing away a lot of turkey. So, in the springtime, there isn't any commercial grower that's really going to want those large strain birds. So what they do is they send them out to backyard growers. Okay, Back, backyard growers think their turkeys are great. They think they're growing great and everything. Then they get to like my processing plant, and you know we have baby ostriches. Okay, we dressed some birds last year that were reaching sixty pounds. Okay, now the exact opposite thing happens when you get into June, July, and August is um, these hatcheries are shipping out their stock to commercial growers like myself. And those, those small and midgets and, you know, the smallest strain birds are the ones they'll send out to people in June, July, and August, um, because I don't want them. They don't get big. We were sent in, we had to get some replacement birds and they sent us in 300 replacement birds. But the person that sent them to us didn't really know us. I, I didn't deal with my regular representative. We got birds, we grew them out at Thanksgiving time. Um, they reached a dressed weight of eight pounds. Needless to say, my wife was a little upset um, because we had all these birds. We had almost 250 tiny birds. We couldn't do anything. We ended up just giving them to the soup kitchens because we couldn't sell them. So when it comes to turkeys, know your strain. It's not just the breed, it's the strain. Um, otherwise you could get yourself in some hot water. One of the things that we stress with our customers that are buying turkeys from us, you dress them according to your use. You know, uh, not all turkeys have to be slaughtered at Thanksgiving time. Um, you can keep, I tell people, slaughter the majority of your birds according to what you want to be putting in your oven in the middle of winter, because we don't all have Thanksgiving dinners throughout the winter time. Maybe you just need a 12 or a 14 pounder during the winter, but at Thanksgiving time, you want a 25 pounder. So get rid of all those other birds so you don't have to feed them 
you know, you don't have to care for them and you get the sizes you want. You're not wasting feed and that extra money. And just keep a couple around for Thanksgiving time. We have people show up at our slaughterhouse with one or two turkeys. They're going to eat at Thanksgiving time. We just zip them through, you know. So slaughter them according to your needs, okay? Um, now, I guess I'm supposed to be talking about processing. And um, one of the... Uh, I, I, I love listening to Jennifer talk because it's like, it's, uh, uh, I, I have to tell people about these regulations about slaughtering. We get calls all the time. People will come to us when we're slaughtering and we're so busy. They're like, oh my God, we should open up a slaughterhouse and we should, you know, um, you know, they're so busy. We're only busy one day a week. Okay. In the summertime, we slaughter on Saturdays. Thanksgiving time, we slaughter three days for people. And we're busy those days. But the rest of the year, my, my processing plant is shut down. Right now, I have my four wheelers and lawnmower stored inside there. Um, so the, the processing facilities, when, I, when we constructed our facility, um, God, 25 years ago, we built. And oh, we expanded. We actually built our processing plant backwards, if you will. We, we designed it, I designed it. I, I went to school for food science and sanitation and all that stuff. So I built that processing plant to be cleaned and sanitized first, because at the end of the day of processing poultry, you're tired, you're wet, you just wanna get done. You wanna make it as easy as possible. So we built it to be washed and sanitized first. Then we're gonna slaughter chickens in there. The, um, uh, one of the things I tell people, and they really got to keep it in mind, under the right conditions, bacteria can double every 20 minutes, okay? I mean, it, you know, uh, it gets warm in the slaughterhouse, it's wet, there's a medium for things to grow, you know, so you got to be really careful about your sanitation and your practices, and I mean, we all make mistakes, um, but you, you want to learn from your mistakes and other people's mistakes. I was down in front of the legislature a few years ago, and we were talking about sanitation and I gave them a list of recalls from Tyson Foods, chicken processing. And of course our legislators bit for the bait and they took it and ran with it. And they said, Mr. Graney, you know, they're a big operation and they do millions of chicken, blah, 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 blah. I said, exactly. But you need to remember they hire PhDs in chemistry, microbiology, sanitation, food science, and they still have problems they still have recalls. So the average person processing, whether you do it in your backyard, you have your own little processing plant, make sure you're using the right sanitation, the right soaps and everything. You start cutting corners and you can really run into some problems and some trouble, okay? Um, we, um, uh, we, we work with Eco Labs. They send us up a nice soap. Yeah, it's expensive but it does a nice job. And we, we change around our soaps and sanitizers because not all soaps and sanitizers capture all the bacteria all the time. So we, we change it around, we mix it up. We wash down every day right after uh, processing. Okay, we're tired, you know, we've had a long day, but one chicken, one chicken that's contaminated can get 15 people sick one chicken, okay? One turkey can get 50 people sick. So if you're talking about raising numbers, um, you gotta take that into account because these people that you're selling to are your customers and they're putting their trust in you. So you wanna make sure you're doing the best job you can. You know, nobody sets out to get anybody sick, but it does happen, okay? So that, in saying that, one last thing that I wanna tell people is when you wash and sanitize, Make sure you do a good rinse before you start your operation back up because there's residuals. The chemicals that you put on those tables in your tanks, I don't care how well you rinse them when you wash them down, there's still residuals. You don't want those residuals put left on your birds, okay? You don't want to be feeding that to your grandparents or your, your neighbors or, or your customers, okay? Because you don't know what's going on with them. And it can really make some people sick. So make sure you rinse before you process. I, uh, my crew knows this inside and out. Um, I'm like an old lady when it comes to sanitation and stuff. I like lots of bubbles and I want stuff clean. Um, now, 
the other thing I wanted to say is um, water testing. I talked to a fellow that was going to get into the business of processing. He was scared to get his water tested. And I was like, are you crazy? I said, absolutely get your water tested. The department requires once, once a year. I said, we do it twice a year, once in the spring and once in the fall, because I don't know if something's going to contaminate my well here um, during the summer, you know. Um, but if I'm washing down and I'm chilling birds in water and stuff, I don't want to cope my birds with my equipment with, you know, the nitrites and the, the E. coli and all. I want to know. And those two things, those, those two indicators, the, the E. coli and the nitrate, those are easily rectified easily. So if you go to a state lab, get your water checked, they'll tell you if there's E. coli in there, oh, just do this, this, and this, and you get it rechecked and everything to make sure it's safe because you don't want to be making your customer sick. The other thing that people that process and sell and if you, you want to make sure that you have some type of liability coverage for that product because if you sell a bird, somebody gets sick, Okay, especially a kid or Grammy or Grampy or even the customers. People have nothing to lose and all to gain. They're going to come after you. You make sure you have liability. And regular homeowners insurance doesn't do it. I've told hundreds of people this that contact their insurance company to let them know. Otherwise, you're, you're setting yourself up sooner or later. Sooner or later, somebody's going to have a complaint. Okay. And it's going to go to court and your insurance company will drop you like a bad habit. If they, you're, they find out you're selling something from your house, don't assume you have liability coverage on your products. Make sure you have it written in and have a copy of it. Okay. Um, now that I've scared, scared you out of the poultry business, um, let me see here. Um, the, um, um, if you're gonna get into raising some poultry, whether you're gonna just raise it for yourself or you're gonna raise it to sell at a farmer's market or whatever, you can look things up on the internet, okay? A lot of people that give advice on the internet, um, uh, Salerson is a great resource. Um, he's written books about raising poultry in another state, in another climate, okay? A lot of that doesn't apply to Maine. Okay, so if you're going to raise poultry in me, talk to somebody that's been doing it. You know, if you're going to get into the business, talk to somebody that's been in the business a little bit. You, you, you'll find out about the pitfalls and things to watch out for. And if you're going to be selling the birds, I can tell you right now, they'll probably also tell you who to sell to and who to stay away from. Okay, um, but farmers tend to be very opinionated. Okay, um, if you're going to get into selling the birds, Make sure you know your markets, okay? I, I have so many people that got into the business and I mean, they had the, the lion's heart on raising poultry. They grew beautiful poultry, but you need to realize that there's companies out there that will take advantage of somebody new. And uh, unfortunately, I know too many people that, um, didn't get paid for their poultry and they went out of business and they went out hot. Now I'm not talking big places. I'm talking, you know, they raised 500, but just all I can tell you is to be careful and go slow. Don't jump into this, you know, this market uh, of selling poultry too quickly because what's going to happen is you're going to get scared. You're going to get, you know, anxious because the birds aren't moving, you're going to start dropping your price to move your product. And before long, you're raising the poultry for nothing. Okay. So just go slow. It's nice to be little. We stay small for a reason. Okay. Because I want to know my customers and I want to know the wholesale accounts. I can call any of my wholesale accounts up and I can talk to the owner by first name and they know me. And, you know, I, I'm not interested in being Frank Purdue of me, you know, um, We've been approached by Shaw's to sell to Shaw's and Hannaford's. It's like nothing doing. I have no interest in it just because they're too big. Um, when it comes to, you know, the Department of Agriculture and licensing, don't be afraid of that. You know, these guys put their pants on one leg at a time like you and I. They have a job to do. Their job is public safety. OK, now. I can tell you from my years of experience, it's, it's hard to believe over 40 years I've been doing this, okay? And 
the Department of Agriculture, you know, they're a regulatory agency, you know, they, they got rules and regulations. It's to protect the customers, but it's to protect your customers. Once you get a customer, you want to you wanna protect that customer, you know, like it's one of your own kids. And if the Department of Agriculture is coming up saying, hey, Scott, you know, uh, uh, I need you to wash this a little bit better. I need you to do this. I'm all about it. That's called free quality control. Somebody coming in, looking over my shoulder. I, I have no problems with that. And if you have a problem with somebody coming in and critiquing you and giving you um, constructive feedback, well, maybe maybe poultry farm is not for you because we all look over each other's shoulders and stuff. And, you know, but the, the Department of Agriculture, yeah, we've had a few nose to nose discussions or arguments, if you will, but, you know, the long, sh the long, um, uh, the, well, the, the outcome is that my customers are getting a better product and I know it's safe. I can sleep at night because I got the Department of Agriculture behind me. I have my water tested. I know I got liability coverage. You know, we have it. We've never used it, but it's like, you know, it's just nice. You don't want to be that nervous because when you get that knock on the door. Now, um, some people are afraid to talk to them. They, 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 I'm telling you, they, they, they're good people and the vast knowledge. If you've got a problem, they can help you figure it out. They might not have the answers, but they can tell you who to talk to. Now, when it comes to raising poultry, whether it be turkeys or chickens, one of my favorite people is uh, uh, Ann Lichtenberg, Lichtenberg, I can never say her last name, but she's up at the Poultry Pathology Unit up in Bangor. I'm telling you, I, I go out in my barn and if a turkey is sneezing or something like that, I'll snap that turkey up and bring it up to Ann and Ann will tell me, okay, Scott, relax, this is nothing because with poultry, respiratory diseases can spread so fast. But I go up there, call Ann up, hey, Ann, this is what's going on this. I don't know what's happening, but but, but. they have pulled my butt out of a fire more times than once, okay? Their services are so cheap. It's like, I can't believe that we can get the testing done. You know, they'll do a necropsy and just tell you, hey, this is what's going on in your farm. Just, you know, biosecurity, you know, um, yeah, if you're raising poultry, you must know about biosecurity. But, um, you know, you need to network with these people, people at the Department of Agriculture, and at least get to know Ann and, and go down and talk to Jennifer and, and all those folks. But uh, um, resources, resources, you know, um, and you talk to other farmers. Um, farmers like to tell a lot of whopper stories. I've dealt with a lot of poultry people, and everybody wants you to think, that they're successful and everything's going wonderful and all that. Yeah, right. Let me tell you, everybody's got their problems. Nobody wants to admit it. So nobody shares. But uh, some of us older farmers are like, oh yeah, huh, I remember when that happened. Welcome to the club, you know? But um, um, let me see here. Um, well, if this see. has been great. We do have another person. Uh, to okay, start. I'm finished. <laughs> uh, if you could stay on, uh, sure. we may have some more time and we can go over time. Uh, I can keep this Zoom meeting going for as long as people want to hang out. Uh, but I did want to give uh, Kilby Young from Old Haven Farm a uh, chance to speak. He's going to share his screen. And I just wanted to let folks know, I put the link to your uh, Greenies Turkey Farm, but it's mainpoultry.com. Yeah, the we're on Facebook. I mean, people can go on Facebook and my daughter set up, so I don't know how you friend it or something like that, but people send me messages on Facebook and we answer those. Yeah. Okay. Well, if, uh, now where's Kilby here? Here. You can, you should be able to share your screen. All right. All right. Um, so I'll, I'll introduce myself really quick. Uh, I am not a poultry farmer. I learned better. Uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, I did everything Scott said not to do when we first started out. Uh, I read Saladin books and said, we're going to go raise pastured poultry in Maine. And I very quickly realized that is a difficult thing to do and do well. And it's a good way to lose money. Um, so also with biosecurity. So, uh, yep, I have um, heeded some wisdom after the fact, but I, you know, I have a lot of respect for folks who do grow poultry and grow it well. Uh, it's something that you have to decide that fits your business model. And, 
and and you have to be able to make money at it. So um, it, from from my perspective, I'm I'm looking at it from more of a commercial side. Uh, but what we have figured out that we can do pretty well is raise pigs. Um, so when we started five years ago, we started with you know I think a dozen pigs, and now we've got well over three hundred on farm, uh, and our continuing to scale up. Uh, so that's been a, a process. Um, and over the last couple of years, uh, we, we've seen more growth uh, with our retail market because we started processing on farm. Um, you know, with, with the whole farming thing for, for me, uh, I'm not, I was not born into it. Uh, I started it in my early 30s uh, when we moved to Maine. Um, and so it's been a process of learning every step of the way. Uh, there have been a lot of calls to um, Department of Ag. There have been a lot of YouTube videos. There have been a lot of pigs breaking loose. Um, and thankfully, we're over a lot of those humps. Uh, but um, the, the decision to process on farm uh, was something that we kind of dipped our toes into a few years back. Uh, because we really wanted something to set our products apart from other farms. I mean, you go to a you go to a farmers market or a co-op, and and everybody's got sweet Italian, hot Italian, uh, maple flavored breakfast sausage. Because nobody actually has breakfast sausage with maple syrup in it anymore, um, and you know pork chops that are packaged, however they're packaged, and the damaged vacuum seals, um, and so we have. Uh, I've always been good at flavors and blending flavors and creating a kind of a unique experience through that. Um, so we started off just a few years back um, making sausage. Uh, at that point, we had our processor grind everything for us and we'd bring it back. We would blend our seasonings and package and, and go. Um, and, you know, that that became uh, not very cost effective to pay your butcher to grind all of your pigs all the time. Uh, so that coupled with uh, the pandemic this year, um, we started, sorry, my cat. <laughs> uh, we started doing uh, much more of the processing ourselves on farm. Um, so having, having some time to figure out what the regulations were, what we could and couldn't do, um was was nice before we started cutting carcasses ourselves uh, and you know it's like everything else that all of us have done with with farming or careers or whatever uh it's a lot of trial and error um so you know if you have a, a retail market that you need to keep feeding and you're wanting to go to processing on farm then you better make sure that you've got the ability to to keep to, to maintain that retail market. Uh, I'll go ahead and do my screen share just to show you guys a little bit of our setup. Um, sorry, I'm not a Zoom guy, so give me just a moment. And at the bottom is a green button that says share screen. Okay, so share screen. Okay, sure. Over to the right, there's a button you have to hit. Now, it's... I made you a, a co-host, I believe. Yeah, it, uh, it wants me to... There we go. Okay. Desktop. There you go. We see it. All right. So let me open my keynote. And, um, there we go. Is that working? Yes, very good. Okay. Um, so this is just kind of a, a little kind of snapshot of what we do. Um, had some fun last month. We broke down uh, eight eight carcasses. I should say I broke down eight carcasses. Um, so it's it's something if you decide to do, you've got to make sure you have the time to do it. Uh, be honest, I don't have the time to do it, but um, I'm making the time. Uh, and, you know, it's a, it's a learning experience, but it's also a lot of fun. You get to know that next step of what your animals are really like. You see, you see their health, you know, based on the individual carcass. You can tell what pig was, was 
more dominant. You can see if there are any injuries. You can see uh, it, it. It's nice. It I think it gives you a fuller picture of of how you're raising your animals and changes you might need to make. Um, and then if you look over to the photo to the right, that's that is one of our more recent uh, sausages that I that I made, and that is a uh, coconut curry sausage. So peanut butter, uh, coconut, carrots, uh, all kinds of fun stuff. So, you know, you get to really explore um, whatever you want to uh, within reason uh, as far as flavors. Um, so this is kind of a snapshot of our processing area. I, I use for most of my cutting, I use a uh, eight foot table that I've got, um, got a butcher block on and uh you know basic meat mixer and uh 30 pound sausage press and over in the back i've got another picture of it there is uh, a relatively new vacuum sealer um we've had that for about five months um but you know again with cutting stuff on your own uh with what you see in that that photograph um and down at the bottom under that table is a is a, um, a grinder uh, that represents a $20,000 investment. Um, so it's, if you're doing it to save money, uh, you've got to be at a scale that your butcher fees are incredibly expensive. Um, it's not something that I recommend, you know, bootstrapping, get the right equipment. That way you have stuff that you know, you're going to be able to clean stuff, you know, you're going to be able to rely on um, stuff that's safe. Uh, um, there's another example of something we did this year. Uh, we took our, our December slaughter and we sold porchettas. Uh, our customers loved it. They're really, really good. And if you've ever had the cracklings from the outside of a porchetta, it's a good way to annoy the rest of your family. Um, and the vacuum sealer. Uh, so this was, uh, this vacuum sealer was a little over $4,000. And um, I bought it. I bought the largest, uh, tabletop sealer you could get um, because you never know what kind of cut you're going to seal. And this allows us to seal, I think, uh, seven packages of sausage simultaneously. Uh, so it really cuts down on the amount of time that we're spending uh, on the vacuum sealer. So, um, and that's a photograph of, of now, chose the wrong bags off the get-go. Um, I wasn't really happy with them. They, a lot of customers put the bags in the microwave to defrost and they were metallic on the back and learned that uh, it was good to uh, spark in the microwave. Uh, so that's, that's the photos that I have, just kind of give you an idea of that. So let me switch back to Zoom here and Jennifer says, buying the right equipment, uh, you also put yourself in a good position to move up to inspection later if your business is going well and you want to expand. Yeah, she's, uh, we've had some conversations and, um, you know, one of the, one of the things that you have to look forward to if you're doing this and, and the problem that, the predicament that we're in right now is we thought we'd make some sausage. Um, and then still process our pigs. And now we're, we're to the point where we outgrew our processor. Um, and so now we have our slaughters done and then take carcasses back. And because we're doing that, we outgrew our space. Uh, I might also add that we, we have about three acres of certified organic produce. Um, so our biggest concern right now is food safety. Uh, if I'm in there cutting carcasses, I don't want any of our produce in there. Uh, and we've got to do a full sanitization uh, before we can bring vegetables in and wash. Uh, we don't ever use our, our meat packing table for produce at all, um, but it's something that we're very aware of. And so now we're in that next, uh, next phase of investment uh, to where we've uh, broken ground on uh, an expansion of the building. Uh, so we'll have a, uh, we're adding a 24 by 43 expansion on the back of our store and commercial kitchen. And half of that will be dedicated to meat processing. Um, just because I need to be able to, you know, this time of year, it's great. It's easy to get that room cold. But in the summertime, 
controlling temperature is a big issue. So, you know, you've only got an hour to two hours at a time that you can cut um, and keep that, that carcass at a, a temperature that's, that's safe for consumers. Um, so, you know, all, all told, you know, we've, we've got about a $20,000 investment into the, into the kitchen space. Um, you know, some people have done it for less, some people do it for more. Uh, and then equipment. Um, I was actually taking delivery on a, on a new smoker today. Uh, so, you know, if you include all of the equipment that we bought so far, that's, that's a, uh, probably about a $40,000 investment, uh, total. And then we've got another $70,000 investment that's going into, um, the, the processing area on the backside. So that's, and that will enable us to, um, to move towards state inspection. Um, but that's not something we're going to rush into. Uh, I think, you know, imagining, you know, the, the state has been great in how they set the constraints for, you know, small on-farm processing. You can sell direct to end users. So, you know, you've got your direct to consumer sales, um, and you can have small amounts of sales to restaurants and institutions. The, the place where you, you can't go, uh, in the processing that we're at right now, um, is you can't sell to another retailer. Um, and so if that's something that you need for your market, then you look into state inspection. And, and as we look for towards growth in the future, uh, that's definitely something that, that we, we would like to move towards. Um, but we also have to manage our growth, uh, you know, where we have 300 pigs on farm, uh, that's a full-time job managing that and it requires employees. Uh, and, and then if you add processing and add, uh, everything that goes with state inspection, that, that adds more time. And, uh, you know, we're, we're at the point where, you know, time versus profit are, are questions that we're still asking. So, uh, plus we want to get the other, the other side built and get used to that and, and the flow of that first. But, uh, I don't know, does any, anyone have any questions about, uh, what we do or, uh, hopefully I described why we do it. Colt mentioned that a real vacuum sealer is light years ahead of a food saver that you typically see in home kitchens. It, it is. And, and while food savers are great, um, a chamber vacuum is really the only safe way to do it. Uh, these, these, uh, vacuum pumps suck juices out. And so you constantly have um, juice and animal, you know, you have pathogens all over the machine and it's just not a great way to do it. Um, so yeah, the, the investment in a vacuum sealer, if not for safety, for time uh, is one of the best things that you can do. We, and your coffee we, per bag goes way down. We had to purchase a vacuum pack machine for our turkeys and because of the amount of water that's in poultry, like you're talking those juices, we had a chamber vac, it was a nightmare because we had a lot of leakers. So we stepped up and we had to buy a tipper tie, which, put, which puts a metal clip on the bag, seals it. That was 14 grand. Yeah. But the customers love it. The customers love it. You know, vacuum pack, but clip. But yeah, that the equipment cost is scary. Yeah. And, and you don't have to go head first. Uh, no into into processing and get all this equipment i mean we've we've done this over the course of three years yeah. um and you know there have there have been grants there are loans uh, there's been cash flow um but it's you know it's important like i said earlier we started off with you know weston's would grind our pork and we would take and make our 30 pound batches i had a 10 pound stuffer and you pretty quickly get to, you're either going to sink or swim. You get to the point where, okay, we do have a consumer demand for this and a 10 pound stuffer is not going to cut it because I need to, I need to be more efficient with my time. So you're saying right tool for the right job and aggravation yeah. factor. <laughs> yeah, that, that never <laughs> happened. <laughs> One thing that I don't think we brought up yesterday even, uh, we talked about keeping uh, the cuts of meat or whatever you're selling at the right temperature if you've got frozen and you're going to a farmer's market uh, 
uh, we didn't talk about how you accomplish that. Uh, or if you're transporting product, uh, you know, from your farm to someplace else, uh, how do folks uh, tend to do that? Jennifer, so, um, or Kilby, go ahead. Oh, that's fine. Uh, so, for us, uh, transportation, and I, I don't remember the guidelines right off the top of my head, um, but we we pack everything in coolers. Uh, we do have a walk-in freezer. Um, and so those coolers live in the walk-in freezer. Um, and we pack right before market and unpack as soon as we get back. And, you know, in the heat of the summer, uh, you know, we try to keep everything in the shade, but sometimes there, there's stuff that, you, you know, just needs to come out of circulation you eat for dinner. Um, but you, you've got you've to have good coolers. Uh, you can't get a $20 cooler and expect it to keep your stuff cold for a, for a six hour market. Um, so there's, there's that. And then, you know, the thing that we look at now is, is the, the temperature for when we're actually doing the cutting and the processing. Uh, by the time we, I, I take a carcass out, cut it up, grind it up. You know, like I said, this time of year, it's easy. Uh, in the summer, it's take one out, cut it put it back in the cooler, let it cool down, uh, pull it back out, grind it, let it cool down, pull it back out, make sausage. Uh, it's very, it uh, can be very time consuming, um, but really, really important step. Anything else from folks? Have we answered everybody's questions? I do have a polling that I'll put up uh, while we try to encourage people to, to you know, if you have a question, uh, because we only have 16 folks on, uh, you can go ahead and unmute yourself or you can type your question in chat. And we do appreciate you responding to our end of the meeting poll. And as I said, I will be sending uh, an email with uh, links to uh, the recordings, uh, contact information for our speakers, and uh, the copies of any of the PowerPoints that uh, our speakers shared with us. Uh, and just to remind you, we did do this on Facebook. It was live streamed to Facebook, uh, and that recording will live there for I don't know how long it lives there, <laughs> but uh, uh, that's another eternity. Place. <laughs> eternity. Uh, but that's another place that uh, if you want to point someone to, uh, you can point them there. Well, with that, I think we've everybody has answered our poll, so thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and here's the results. Everybody, it, voted yes, it was. Helpful. Donna, I want to I want to add one thing really quick. Um, and you know a few of you guys i know um that are on this and uh if you've been around agriculture especially red meat and poultry processing in maine um, you've probably heard horror stories about processors dealing with the state um, and i just want to encourage people to build a good relationship with the state don't go behind their back don't <sighs> file ridiculous complaints have an open channel of communication with these folks. They're, they're easy to deal with and they know more than you do. Um, if you build a combative relationship with the, the Department of Ag, you're just gonna wanna move to another state. It's, it's, it's not worth it. You wanna have a good open relationship. Scott said it uh, and, and, and I can't- well, they have the resources. How important it is. Yeah. They've got resources. Uh, these, Free. <laughs> these people want, they want you to succeed. They yeah. want you to be able to do things, but you have to understand the constraints that they operate by and you have to respect it. Um, so I would just say that's a really, really, really important thing. If I could add one more thing um, for the folks that are thinking about getting into the poultry, just go really slow. Okay, don't jump in both feet and start raising 500 birds and hope you have a market. I mean, there's good markets out there, but just 
you know, go slow. I tell people that all the time. You know, sometimes we have people that raise four turkeys and the next thing they're raising 50 and it's like, wow. But, um, and make sure you communicate with whoever's gonna process your birds or if you're gonna do them yourself, just make sure you're well prepared. Well, uh, okay, uh, Megan says, uh, I don't have any specific questions today, but uh, uh, she's here for general learning and to see if some, there is something that they wanna try in the future. The general information has been really helpful over the past two days, it seems like there is a lot of support out there. She says, thank you to all. And I will uh, cool. also uh, chime in. I do appreciate our speakers. Uh, I think it has been, uh, you know, really helpful to folks. Uh, and, uh, you know, hopefully we'll, uh, I was excited to hear Michelle say that she had a completed application as a result of yesterday's. Uh, that's very impressive. I'm, I'm glad we were able to help. Any other questions before we sign off? Okay, I'm gonna disconnect the uh, live stream to Facebook. And I will be stopping the recording.